Yes, the Air Force said throughout World War II conducted special training for certain crew positions. Among those on the crew, there were, of course, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, radio operator, and five gunners. We came together, that is my crew, which was called number 5860. We came together in uh, Alexandria, Louisiana in May of 1944. Then we trained together as a crew from May 44 until early August and were then sent to Kearney, Nebraska, of all places. And in, at Kearney, Nebraska, we were given a brand new, new B-17. We were to take it overseas f for the Air Force. Uh, we left Kearney, let's see the date, we left Kearney in early August or late July 1944. I should tell for the record that the night before we left, we went out and consumed a considerable amount of Nebraska's best beer. And we came back and then we decided that we would all take a shower together, but with our uniforms on. So we were quite, quite a sorry looking bunch by the end of that crazy night. The next day we got up and the next afternoon, I should say, and we then started our trip from Nebraska with stops at various places en route, we flew the new plane to our destination, Italy, a little town near Foggia, which was called Amendola, Italy. And what I want to do today, and this is an aside, if you will, or a little more detail, than I gave in my earlier presentation. Unhappily, by we arrived in the squadron in August, August 18th, to be exact, 1944. And by, uh, by September 13th, a month later, I was the only one left Others in the crew had been involved in a, a very bad day that our group had. We lost five aircraft that day, and the pilot of my crew and all six enlisted men were killed in one aircraft. My co-pilot, uh, his plane was badly damaged, but they managed to bail out. He, he my co-pilot, became a prisoner of the Germans when he bailed out over Poland. Uh, he survived the war, then came home after the war. Uh, I, of course, fortunately had no problems. Uh, one other crewman, the original navigator, was shot down the week after the bad day. The bad day we lost eight of the crew, and Ray Smith, the navigator, the original navigator, he was shot down September 20th. Or I should say he bailed out. He was hit over Budapest bailed out over Yugoslavia, where the partisans, Marshal Tito's partisans, would help 
people that had to bail out over Yugoslavia, he'd get them down to the shore. And the uh, British Navy would work back and forth on the Adriatic Sea, and they would go and pick up, we used to call them stray cats, people that had bailed out over Yugoslavia. I, during that period, I had been grounded just before all that bad period to do a refresher in navigation because it was decided that I should be, should fly as a so-called, uh, they, they used a term other than, we didn't do celestial navigation, we did pilotage and did reckoning navigation. So I was not flying for a good part of September and therefore avoided all of the bad incidents. I resumed my missions October 4th and we went to Munich. Interestingly, I don't know how many people would remember reading that, but the recent Pope Benedict that's now left the papacy, he, he was a flat gunner at Munich, so I figure I met him way early. Uh, that was my first mission after the bed troubles the others had over over Munich, and that wasn't too pleasant either. What I'm intending to do, or would like to do, is try to contact, though it's almost 70 years ago, I have found the hometowns of those who were lost, and I've thought, if I'm able, I'd contact their local newspapers and send information which I have accumulated concerning the losses of their relatives. Presumably they'd be uncles, I hope not fathers, but brothers or what have you. Uh, they, they, the ones that we lost, uh, came from various spots. The pilot was from Paxton, Massachusetts. Uh, my co-pilot was from Medford, Massachusetts. And others, the radio operator was from Cleveland, Ohio. And Paul Gunner was from uh, Baltimore, Ohio. The, the waist gunner and tail gunner were from Texas, and one of the other waist gunners was from o Oklahoma. So I'll get their newspaper, their local newspaper, I thought, and send some of this information to them, and possibly some relatives or family of theirs will recognize their names and uh, be able, if they wish, to make contact with me and I can give them any more information that I have. Mr. Campbell, if you would, could you talk more about, you, you talked about the, the, the very bad day, and it was, a, it was a very, very bad day. And it may have started like any other day, that, all right, you, I think maybe earlier I had mentioned you'd find out, or anybody, uh, any one of us, you'd find out the night before if you were flying the next day and with whom. As I think I mentioned, I had been grounded for, or was told I'd be grounded for a month from early September to uh, early October, 
for a special navigation schooling. Therefore, I was not flying on that bad day. The bad day, the they were going to target would was called Blackhammer. It was a synthetic oil refinery. The Germans had developed the capability to produce synthetic oil, and they did that. I don't know the details, but they used coal, the target that the crew and the group was after was in an area of Poland, actually, called Silesia. It's in southeastern Poland, and it's a heavy coal-producing area. The Germans used the coal and converted it into usable fuel for their tanks and aircraft. They had lost to the Russians, they lost the Ploiesti oil fields, so they were in desperate shape for oil. The, an aside, if you will, but a significant one, the town, the Polish town, near the, this synthetic oil refinery, in Polish and on the on the charts and maps we used, it was called Oswiecim, I think, O S W I E something like that. C C E M. Forgive my pronunciation. But later, we found out the Polish word was Oswiecim. The German word was Auschwitz. Uh, you could see as you flew over Germany every once in a while, you'd see these very distinct rectangular form, form outlines on the ground. And we were always told they were perhaps prison camps. So stay away from them, but it was only later we found out that that was Auschwitz. Uh, but the what we were after was that synthetic oil refinery. The, this gentleman that I made contact with through, I forget what, how I heard about him, but his name is or was Jack Forgy. He lived in Virginia, and he had been, eventually he was written up quite a bit. I know Tom Brokaw found him, but this fellow would do research on missing uh, soldiers or air crew, and I contacted him, and he did a remarkable job on the events of the bad day and the aircraft that were lost, five aircraft were lost. Uh, he also tracked down and this, this is kind of a strange aside, but the Germans probably there thoroughness or whatever, attention to detail. But the Germans did do a good job of uh, tracing like missing air crews. The remains, if you will, of the fellas in my crew, uh, the Germans got that back probably just with dog tags, I don't know. But my crew does, they, they have a marker in the Zachary Taylor Cemetery, military cemetery in near Louisville, Kentucky. So the Germans returned whatever they could. What was the date of this day? The bad day was September 13th, 1944. 
And as I say, the, the group, a group formation would be 28 aircraft. The squadron would be seven. So there were, it was almost, if you think of a diamond, and it was four squadrons of seven aircraft, total of 28. The, that day, it was our squadron that took most of the hit. They lost five aircraft and one from one of the other squadrons. And the colonel that I referred to that did the research for us, he, I won't tie you down with the detail, but anybody who is hearing this and is interested in it, I'll see to it that they get copies of the detail report. A, a remarkable amount of information that he, he accumulated, he being Jack Forgey. Uh, Do you remember all of the names of the crew members you lost? Pardon? Do you remember all of their, the names? The names? Of your crew? Oh, yeah. They were, and if you, there's a picture of the crew that uh, I can get for anyone. Maybe some of the people have it already. And if you look at the crew, the four officers are in the front, kind of hunkered down, uh, scooched down, and reading left to right. The first is Don Reardon. He was the pilot. Next, Chet Lake. He was the co-pilot. Next, myself. I was bombardier at that time. And next is Ray Smith. He was the navigator. The pilot and co-pilot happened, and I, all three, were from Massachusetts. And that was just a freak happening. Ray Smith was from Illinois. The crew in the back row standing up, left to right, is... Uh, Royce Herridge, he was the engineer. Next was Yarrow Braz, B-R-O-Z. He was the radio operator. Then Jake Shinnick, he was the ball turret gunner. Obviously being the smallest one, he had to be. Next was Ray Tree. Uh, he was a waste gunner. Next, Ernie Riggleman, another waste gunner. And the last was Denton Bond, whom we call Pop. He was the oldest guy in the crew. He was 23, so we called him. He was old. Uh, the first we did fly, I, we flew as a crew our first mission in uh, late August of 44. I flew with them that day, and the target, that first target, was part of Beats, Czechoslovakia. The radio operator on our crew, Jaro Braz, was a Czech. He came from Czechoslovakia, but was by then living in Cleveland. And when I briefed the crew to tell them where we were going and mentioned part of Beats. Yarrow was quite upset about that and was telling us that part of Beats, all they do there is make gingerbread. And I've since found out that's true. Part of Beats, Czechoslovakia was, is famous for that. But we weren't bombing the gingerbread factory. We were bombing an airfield up there. Uh, the 
so the crew, I'm trying to think, yeah, we arrived. We arrived in Amendola, arrived in the squadron August 18th. And uh, 33 days later, I was the only one left. So it wasn't a too good a job. Uh, Do you know if they, how they were shot down? Did, did, did they know, do you know if they knew it was coming? Uh, it was the, especially in that type of target, well, any of the targets did vary, but the flak was, was very heavy. It, if you, the only thing, if people go to like a fireworks show where they shoot a little, but that's what the flak is, only it's, it's uh, generally black big black puffs as it explodes. Some of it is white, it's just the types of rounds they use. So that would be a lot of damage, it could do a lot of damage. And of course, German fighters also could do, but they weren't involved. This was, this bad day was all due to flak or the report of this gentleman I referred to, and he did a lot of research on it. It could even, it could have been involved an accident of bomb from one plane hitting another, but I think not, and he thought not, because so many, it's hard to describe, but each, each aircraft was carrying 6,000 pounds of explosives. And so if one got badly hit in a tight formation, it could damage others. But that nobody really knows exactly. How did, but, how did you find out? Pardon? How did you find out about well, we we used to get, when there was a mission out, uh, those of us who weren't flying that day, we were always, we knew that sometime around noon or thereabouts, a, a strike report would be radioed back. To, to our group headquarters, and then the word would get around to those of us who weren't flying that they got to the target and how things went. That day, the strike report came back, excuse me, and indicated the loss of five aircraft. So, so We'd always go out to see the formation come back, but uh, but that day when they said five, so all they said, they lost five aircraft. So we went out to see which ones. And so, but, and then when they, the crews got back, they'd fill you in with any more details. And, uh, so so on that, that day, how many, in addition to your crew, how many service members altogether lost their lives? It was five aircraft, so that'd be 50, 50 people. And my, of my crew, Ray Smith and I did not fly that day. Uh, the other eight all flew. Uh, and of those eight, the only one that <coughs> the co-pilot went down, but he was captured and survived the war. 
the others that didn't didn't make it. Uh, my co-pilot was. He, he, they got hit over that target, but they were trying to head to the Russian lines. <clears throat> but they couldn't make it, so they bailed out. And Chet got taken care of by Polish farmers for a couple of weeks or more. But then the Germans uh, spotted him or took him as prisoner. Oh, this is yeah. the fellow who had your jacket, is that right? He's the fellow that had my jacket. Yes, and as I think I mentioned, he told me he had gave it to a Polish farmer. <laughs> what was it? What was it like on on the base of, after learning of this tragedy? This sounds kind of strange or weird to say, but I I don't know. I I think. And I don't mean it to sound harsh. Either. I th think there are situations like that where you figure that can happen, and it didn't happen to me. And it, I, I don't, uh, I don't recall the first mission that I flew after that was to Munich, October fourth. And uh, I truly, that day, and it wasn't, this is, is strange, I should probably run this by a psychiatrist or something. That day I was apprehensive. The conditions over the target were very bad. And I was convinced this, this is where I'm going to get off. This is the end of the line. And I don't say this, whatever, bravado. I truly, was, I just felt like it was like hypnotized, like I'll, like I'll be done. Do you think that the, was a common, a common coping mechanism? I, it might have been. I, did. yeah, you. You'd have. Uh, I don't. I don't recall my, myself. You'd get starts or f quick uh, jolt or something, but uh, certainly most. You'd take one day at a time or one incident at a time. I think I did perhaps mention in the earlier tape, but uh, this fellow is quite a fun guy, a common comedian, I guess. <coughs> he was our goop, bombardier. And we got tired. He was more experienced, more senior than we were. And we were talking about the flak, and he said, "He said, don't let it bother you." He said, "If you if you see it, it missed you, and if it hits you, you won't see it." And I remember trying to work that in my mind, but it didn't work too well. How did how did the the experience of that day affect, if if it did, the the remainder of your time in the service? Uh, again, it sounds harsh to say it. I didn't dwell on it. It was a jolt, so to speak. I did, about three weeks after that, they sent me to rest camp at Capri, the Isle of Capri, which was beautiful. And I, I did kind of lose it a little there for a while, but, but other than that, uh, it's sort of harsh as it sounds. You take one day at a time, I guess, 
and uh, but as I said at the outset, I've I've felt getting back into some of the details of my service and reading names. I thought I never did contact and I never was contacted by family members of those fellows that we lost. And that's why I thought with this recording and plus I've got uh, through the good efforts of that gentleman I mentioned, I have the addresses, names and addresses of their probably parents on next to kin. But what I've, as I mentioned, what I thought would be, you know, put one of my sons to work on it perhaps. But for instance, like the engineer was from Bonham, Texas. I'm sure Bonham, Texas must have a local paper or something. And I thought uh, I'd put something together and uh, send it and let them do it. Does anybody know? I did have, I should have shown you this, but after the war, I was on a business trip down in New Jersey and as I was going along the interstate, I saw a sign, Maywood, Maywood, New Jersey. And the only reason that caught my eye was I flew in a bomber with the name Miss Maywood on it and a little plaque saying the people of Maywood bought war bonds and to give us the bomber. So anyhow, I, on my way back, I thought, oh, I'm going to drive down into Maywood. Maywood, New Jersey, I'd say, is certainly smaller than Avon, small as um, Canton or something, very small. But I drove in, just drove around, went to the gas station, I asked, do you have a newspaper yet? <clears throat> Make a long story short, I went in, saw the little, the, I shouldn't say little, the editor, told him who I was and how I flew in a bomber, Miss Maywood. So he, uh, he, the paper was a weekly paper, so he wrote up an article about me visiting in Maywood, blah, blah, blah. And the article wound up saying he asked around, but nobody re remembered. The so next week, he got a big picture of the plane, of the crew that flew it on its last mission. I flew in it on its 99th mission. That's why they made a big to-do of it. The plane lasted for a hundred minutes. And he put that in the paper, and he sent me all of this. The next week, there's a big picture of the plane and the crew. That's, there, there it is there, the, the picture, to the one closest to you. That's the plane and the crew that flew it. And that picture was uh, on the front page of their paper and big write-up because it said several members of the American Legion remembered it. And they had that photo. And so. If you had an opportunity to, to talk to one of the families, of one of the, the lost crew members, what, what would you want to share with them? There again, it's one of those mixed feelings. First, 
I've, I did talk with my co-pilot's family, and my co-pilot and his wife, we got together. They lived down at the Cape. We visited them and all. So that went, of course, quite easily because there was a natural give and take. But with the others, I, I don't know. For, it's such a span of years. It's got to be, what's the arithmetic, 70 years or something. But uh, but I, I just I, I just feel the way <coughs> they were lost. Nobody in their family would probably the Air Force. I'm sure didn't give them any detail about what happened. Uh, so I thought it might be a grandson or something or some relative and then I'd give them whatever they wanted for information. Because I often thought that type, I even had seen copies of the letters that, that the, they'd sent to families. But my co-pilot, whom I made contact with after the war, he had the letter that his mother and father got. And it, you know, it's, we were going to announce that your son was lost, such and such date. <coughs> and then the, the letters there, almost form letters, saying whether any parachutes were seen, and then signing off if we get any more information, we'll let you know, and that was about it, so. And uh, Chet, the, that's my co-pilot, he was from near Boston a, at the time, and of course, and I lived in Springfield, so I was concerned. He and Don Ridden, who lived near Worcester, went down and I thought, what if their families contact my family? And so I thought, I'll tell my folk. I didn't want to, but I thought it'd be better to tell them I'm okay. And uh, how were you able to do that? Did you? You couldn't, of course, email. But so how did you let your folks know that you were okay by letter? I I wrote. And I've got the letter somewhere, and I wrote, <coughs> I wrote constantly, and they did like every two or three days. So after this bad day, I just didn't quote feel like writing. I didn't write. And then I thought, well, I shouldn't. I, they might wonder why I wasn't writing. And then I thought, with two of them living in Massachusetts. What if their family called? So I, I, I just, I didn't have any detail. I just told them I lost the crew. Now you, you mentioned that you, in order to continue doing your job, you, you had to kind of push that experience, that back. You, had, you didn't think about it a lot. It was just part of part of your service. Did, yeah. did you find yourself later in your life reflecting on, on that day and perhaps other days and, and how did you I think that? I think to this day I do but not not morbidly but you, you can't you can't put it away it's to it's a, just a, the dates are so set in my mind every day and uh, when I had the bed probably I got out before the war was over I got out June 45 
and that was a, that was a bad summer. And then I went to school the following fall. <coughs> but a lot of people that was you know you young and wacky. <laughs> Now, when, when you say it was a bad summer, what what was it that made for a, for a bad summer? Oh, what? what? You, when you were as you were getting out, you, you said that it was a it was a bad summer. Yeah, well, I I got out in June, uh, and uh, they gave us some stipend. Uh, mustering out pay and stuff so so I wasn't hard pressed because I was only 20 years old and I was married I wasn't hard pressed to start working my excuse me went home to my parents house and settled in and there were a few fellows that was already starting to get out and we just and I don't want to mean mess around, but we did hang around and <clears throat> try to see how much beer we could drink, perhaps every day or night. Uh, and I I did for a stretch. Uh, it kind of would stay in here. But I think, it's, 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 what's the old saying, misery loves company. And I went to school and to, out to Notre Dame in the fall. And, you know, didn't they used to have some program, can you top this? So suddenly you realize you, the fellow in the room next to me, and became a big buddy of mine uh, for four years. You know, if I told him anything about this, he could say he flew two missions on D-Day. So, and then you'd go, another guy crash landed somewhere. Was you weren't you weren't. Uh, going to top anyone. Nobody has got top here, so it's just a little. Yeah, the other good friend of mine, he got hit by a German sniper and his shoulder was a mess. Uh, another one, I'm just thinking now, the guys I hung out with, a uh, fellow named Gene O'Neill, and he got badly burned. Uh, he was on an aircraft carrier that uh, kamikaze and so so there was no 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 but you felt that you had people you could talk to who understood your understood you even without maybe saying a whole lot y yeah but I don't reckon you didn't dwell much on it, yeah. And uh, we, it was kind of interesting, I suppose, when you think it was just that sudden putting a whole bunch of fellas, and this wasn't just where I was out there at Notre Dame. That had to be at a lot of colleges uh, all over. Our, if you want to call it chaplain, the guy that the priest out there was later became quite well famous for the Hesburg and <coughs> he was he organized a veterans club and oh boy hey hey famous uh. So what was um, what was the the reaction or the reception on the part of kind of the general public? Do you think to the returning veterans? Was there um, did did you get a sense that people had a, had an idea of what you had, you had gone through, what your experiences were? Did you get a sense of appreciation 
Was it just that so many had served that? Yeah. I don't don't recall any big particular thing. I think it was as you mentioned, it was a common place. Who wasn't in the service, you know? Whose son wasn't in the so and there was never a, you never felt uh, you know, it wasn't a competition in Kenya top. A good way to bore some guys quickly was to, they'd say like war stories, they'd walk away. Because everyone had those to tell. It was uh, the funny ones, you, you know, you'd tell. But, uh, is, there, is there a funny experience that, you, that you'd like, or two, that you'd like to share? Yeah, I suppose we had a lot of them. Did I? I think I did mention earlier, because I always think of that the night before. Yeah, the night before we left, we all got bearded up and took showers. Yeah. And, we, and with big bars of felt snap that <laughs> on, we were taking a shower with your clothes on. Quite a mess. And, uh, we, we had a lot of fun in the squadron. We had a big Nissan hut, if you know what those are. And that was, we call that the office's mess and the club. It was raunchy. But our squadron commander, Colonel Schaefer, Bob Schaefer, he was a tremendous guy and we'd, we'd have a lot of fun and we had songs that go on and on, some mildly raunchy, but all, all about, about the cold. But, uh, so is there, is there anything else that you'd like to, um, to add to the conversation today? Well, the, sure. as I said at the outset, what I really, and it occurred to me when we did the earlier interview, I, I've i never forgotten my crew, but only when I was doing all that paper research, so to speak, and I thought, well, they, I know where they're from, and they have an address in here, so I think I'll just take a shot in the dark and see if I make contact with any family. I I wouldn't be surprised to find, well, I shouldn't say that, that they went as young men, but I doubt there are many. I know, I know Chet, my co-pilot, passed away a year ago, and others I'm sure <laughs> But I thought if family, like grandkids or something, might get a kick out of some of it. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, is there, I'm sorry, is there anything else? Pardon? Was there something else you wanted to add? No, no, I, I think I pretty well covered it. Let me just look at some of these horrible notes, I think. I I did tell you the, they use the term their remains or this retired colonel that helped do the research for me. He gave me even where their remains are in that cemetery in Louisville. Now is that all of them? No, it's, uh, it's not, it's about four, I think. So, so I don't, but they, back to what I was saying, you know, I had another friend that got shot down up in what they call the Dolomite region, the Brenna Pass up in the Alps, Northern Italy. And uh, he, he didn't survive or he got shot down 
got killed that day. And his, his daughter threw, I don't know, I forget how, she, she located me as someone who might know her father. She, she was born while he was over there, so he never met her. But she died the past year or two of cancer. But so she contacted me and I fell on her father's in one of these pictures. That's her father there holding a beer up. Back, and of course, that's me here. Great. Yeah. Well, Mr. Campbell, I want to thank you very, very much for your yeah. time today. Yeah. For sharing your stories here. More than. More than welcome, and I thank you for your professional efforts.